Yes, well, uh, my name is Alex J. O'Connor. Uh, I run a YouTube channel talking about uh, political and educational secularism, uh, known as Cosmic Skeptic. Um, I also spend some time talking about the existential debate surrounding God, which is kind of what I want to uh, talk about tonight. I suppose maybe to start with, maybe a show of hands. Does anybody know who I am or what I do? Oh, wow. Wow. Well, this is much more than I thought. This is great. So, um, a lot of the things that I've got in this presentation I haven't talked about before, so hopefully there's something in it for everybody. Um, but I'm excited to hear what you guys think of what I have to say. Um, I suppose I should begin briefly by uh, expressing gratitude to well, not only the, a a uh, the ACSJ, but also the wider Californian community whose hospitality has kind of far exceeded my expectations. It's, it's my first time in the United States. Um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been great. In entirely coincidental that I'm here for the 4th of July as well. It's been great sort of celebrating the liberation of the 13 colonies from the tyranny of the British. I can only hope that there are <laughs> no hard feelings, right? <laughs> Perhaps uh, 241 years is enough for the animosity to die down. I've heard some people call it you had the original Brexit. Um, yeah, right, yeah. Well, it's, it's relevant uh, because when I was, I was on the, the plane over here, uh, 11 hours is a long time, and I remember looking around and thinking, um, you know, I was wondering how many of the people may be coming over to celebrate the 4th with their family. Um, but at the same time, I, I couldn't help but think that whilst many of us, well, many of you Americans will be uh, spending this time celebrating the kind of liberation exemplified in the actions of the founders, um, many people will be spending this week, as they do most weeks, spending most, if not all, of their time doing the exact antithesis of this. That is to say that there'll be celebrating their chains and expressing unwavering gratitude to the very authoritarian who enslaves them. Um, it, it, it's too easy these days. It's too easy to sort of bash God and talk about the moral implications of religion. But it seems like we're, we're beating a dead horse at this point. It's been done. The books have been written. And we've all heard sort of celestial North Korea before. But nothing seems to change. And uh, if you ask me, the reason for this is because you're not going to convince anybody just by talking about the moral implications of religion. In order to change somebody's uh, ability to uh, secularize their politics and education, you have to create the wiggle room that allows them to do so. What I mean by that is that if you just go around talking about God as an evil dictator, nobody cares because it's God. He can do what he likes. The only way that you're going to change somebody's mind on this is by saying, well, perhaps this God doesn't even exist. And then maybe, okay, if he doesn't exist, maybe that's a good excuse to not allow him to uh, influence my politics. Um, so today I wanted to talk about, well, I've been afforded 30 minutes to talk about what I think is one of the oldest arguments in the book. Um, the reason being that if you speak to anybody of any age with little to no philosophical experience and ask them why perhaps they're an agnostic or a believer, um, you'll almost invariably be met with the same response. And that's something along the lines of this. Where did it all come from? If, if there's no cause, if there's no God, then why is there something rather than nothing? Why does anything exist at all? Um, and if you ask me, this is actually a primitive form of a cosmological argument. Cosmological, I think that's why uh, Apple charged $3,000 for their laptops. Um, cosmological simply means uh, that which pertains to the origin and development of the universe, so cosmology. So a cosmological argument just talks about where things came from. Um, and these arguments are as old as time. They date back at least as far as the ancient Greeks. Um, you guys know who that is? Aristotle. Yeah, great. Um, who talked about an unmoved mover. This is one of the sort of oldest recorded versions of a cosmological argument. Um, but of course, Aristotle was a polytheist, and he believed in an eternal universe. But his works did influence uh, theologians of the future, not least this guy. This is Thomas Aquinas, a 13th century uh, theologian and monk, who uh, famously in his unfinished work, Summa Theologica, presented five famous ways of proving God. Uh, the first three of which are the ones that we care about. Uh, the others are equally bad, but less relevant. Um, you can see they all sort of basically rely on the same kind of logic. If there's movement in the universe, there must be a first mover. If there's causes in the universe, there must be a first cause. There must be some kind of non-contingent being. Otherwise, how did anything get here? But of course, it takes but the logic of a five-year-old to say, okay, well, if everything needs a cause, then what caused God? A fair question, but 
A few centuries earlier, in fact, in uh, Islamic theological circles, people such as Al-Kindi and Al-Ghazali uh, were talking about this very thing. And they effectively changed one of the premises. Instead of saying that everything has a cause, now all of a sudden it's that everything that begins to exist has a cause. That's the change that they made, and that's what gave us what we call the Kalam cosmological argument. Kalam simply is the Arabic word for uh, to argue or discuss. Um, and eventually this has been going around for, for many years, and one of the reasons that most of us here may have heard of the argument is because of uh, Western philosophers uh, such as this guy. <laughs> this is uh, Mr. Sorry, <clears throat> Dr. William Lane Craig, who uh, wrote a book in 1979 called The Kalam Cosmological Argument. Now, um, let it not be said that I'm trying to tamper with anybody's premises here. I've gone straight to his website, reasonablefaith.org, if that's not an oxymoron, if you ever heard one, <laughs> and got the premises for his version of the Kalam Cosmological Argument, um, which, in effect, goes as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist, therefore, the conclusion, the universe has a cause. Seems pretty simple, in fact, almost deceptively simple if you ask me. It's one of the reasons why it's such a seductive argument and has lasted for so long. Um, we are dealing with an antique here, okay, so we can't be taking this kind of stuff lightly. Um, but that's pretty much the history lesson over. I thought I'd fill you in. I, I'm sure that many of you are uh, already familiar with the argument, uh, starting with Aristotle through Al-Kindi, uh, Al-Ghazali and Thomas Aquinas, William Lane Craig, and finally, it's ours to play with. And play with it we shall. So, the premises. Most people, when they see this and they're trying to debunk it, they jump straight to the second premise. This seems the easiest to debunk. The reason being um, is you can simply ask, well, how do you know? How do you know that the universe began to exist? Now, to be sure, the Big Bang happened. Okay, we're pretty certain of it at, at this point, but the Big Bang never claimed to be the beginning of everything. Only the beginning of everything that we know of. There's nothing to say that our Big Bang wasn't just the death of a prior universe, or that there's some kind of infinite multiverse, or perhaps even one large space-time fabric with localized areas of activity, one of which is our universe. Now, what we could do is say, well, you can't prove that this is the case, so the argument's flawed, it's debunked, and we can all go home. But that would be no fun. And so I don't want to focus on premise two. We're going to give the theist the, uh, the benefit of the doubt here and instead talk about premise one. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now, there are a number of glaring issues with this, um, some of which may have already immediately occurred to you, um, but I'll be interested to see if you have any more. Um, but the first problem that I have with this is, well, if you look at the argument uh, firstly, one of the reasons it's so persuasive, uh, persuasive is because it comes across as a deductive argument. That is to say that if you agree with the premises, you cannot disagree with the conclusion. This is fair to say. So we're not going to be able to debunk this by talking about the relationship between the premises and the conclusion, but by talking about the premises themselves. Um, and although this is a deductive argument, it relies upon inductive reasoning. Now. I don't have to spell this out to you, but in effect, picture yourself, if you will, on a desert island. Um, this island happens to be inhabited by cats. Now, you have no contact with the outside world. Every cat on the island is black. You might be tempted to then conclude that every cat in existence is black, which, of course, we know is not the case. Seems a perfectly reasonable assumption for this guy to make, um, but we know it's not true. So just because everything we've seen beginning to exist has a cause, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that begins to exist has a cause. But of course, this isn't a fatal flaw. Science is based on induction, it has to be. And uh, it, it's just worth bringing up uh, because of the case that it seems to be a deductive argument, but really the logic that it's based upon isn't. Um, but just with that out of the way, the, the first most pressing issue that I come across with this argument is what's known as the fallacy of composition. You may already be familiar with it. In effect, the fallacy of composition occurs when you take a characteristic of the constituent parts of a whole and apply that characteristic to the whole itself. So, as an example, picture, if you will, a brick wall. Now, the constituent parts of the brick wall are, of course, the bricks. Now, we could be tempted to make the argument every brick in the wall is red, therefore, the wall is red. Perfectly sound. Nothing wrong with that. And this is why the fallacy is so seductive, because it works some of the time. 
but the fallacy lies in assuming that it works all of the time, which it does not. For example, if we shrink the brick, we now might be tempted to say, well, every brick is small, therefore the wall is small, right? Well, of course, this isn't the case. Um, you can have a very large wall with very small bricks, and there are countless examples of this that you can find. Uh, no atom is alive, therefore nothing made of atoms can be alive. Obviously, this is not the case. Bertrand Russell, in a famous BBC debate, put it this way, I can illustrate what seems to me your fallacy. Every man who exists has a mother, and it seems to me that your argument is that therefore the human race must have a mother, but obviously the human race hasn't a mother, that's a different logical sphere. Okay, every sheep in a herd has a mother, but the herd doesn't have a mother itself. Everything in the universe may have a cause, but that doesn't mean that the universe itself has a cause. And this is, in effect, uh, the fallacy of composition. The next thing to talk about is causality, because this is what the argument relies upon. Um, causality is the relationship between cause and effect. Um, now, of course, logically, we all know that on a timeline, cause must always precede effect. This is just a law of the universe. You cannot have a cause and effect occur at the same time, and you certainly can't have a cause occur after uh, its effect. And this is what the argument is effectively based upon. But there's a problem in this, and it's similar to the fallacy of composition. The problem with this is time. For something to come before something else, we require time. The Kalam cosmological argument um, relies on causality, that causes come before effects, that the universe must have a cause, because the universe is an effect, it must have a cause, and the cause must come before that effect, and if it's before or outside of the universe, it must be supernatural, and that's pretty godly. But the problem is, when everything came into existence, that includes time. Okay, in the early 20th century, Einstein showed that time and space are just two sides of the same coin. So, if time came into existence at the Big Bang, or the, the I mean, the, the large Big Bang, whatever caused the uh, everything to come into existence, if we're assuming again that the Big Bang was the beginning of everything, because we are giving the theists the benefit of the doubt, that would include time. So to say that a cause of the universe came before the universe, well, there was no before the universe. Perhaps when there's no time, causes can uh, occur at the same time or after their effects, or maybe causes aren't needed at all. Again, what we're doing is we're saying everything in the universe, uh, every effect in the universe has a cause, um, therefore the universe itself has a cause. But this, again, is sort of another form of the fallacy of composition. You can't apply the same logic uh, to the universe just because that logic applies to things within the universe itself. This is the fallacy of the argument. Um, and these are, these are interesting points. And the reason that I, I, I bring these up is because when you're discussing this with somebody, um, you might know that an argument sounds bad. You, you might not quite be able to put your finger on it, but you know that something's wrong, like the ontological argument. A lot of people have a problem with. Um, so it's always good to have some arguments under your belt. But the thing is, and I sincerely hope that you don't feel I've wasted all of your uh, precious times, but it doesn't actually matter. Everything that I've said so far, the causality, the composition, the fallacy of composition, uh, the inductive reasoning, it doesn't make a difference. And the reason is because there's an even more glaring issue that's staring us right in the face that I ignored for so long until somebody showed it to me and I thought, my God, how didn't I think of that before? And I said, my God, because old habits die hard. <laughs> the problem is in the first premise, again, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now, people don't spend enough time just thinking about what this implies. When have you ever seen anything begin to exist? Well, uh, I made a little list. Examples of things that have been created out of nothing, that's what that means. Um, firstly, of course, we have the universe. When the universe came into existence, it truly did come into existence out of nothing. Okay, because for the universe to be born, if there was something before it, then that would be encompassed by the universe. So this did truly begin to exist out of nothing. Second... Oh, it's not broken at all. That's it. <laughs> that is it. The universe, there's nothing else. Now, okay, sure. What about a car, you say? There's a, there's a mini plant just down the road from where I live in Oxford, England. Um, and cars come into existence all the time there. 
But do they really? I mean, sure, a car might come into existence, but haven't we really just rearranged a bunch of pre-existing stuff and given it a new name? I mean, if I rearrange the order of these chairs and call it something else, nothing's begun to exist. I've just rearranged something. A car is made by rearranging car parts, which obviously I have a very extensive knowledge of. Your engine, um, windshield washer. Anyway, that's also made out of parts. This is, uh, these are the parts of an engine. And the engine parts break down into uh, metallic atoms. And of course, atoms break down to subatomic particles. But you see the problem here. Because particles themselves, the, the atoms that are inside us and inside most of the things that we touch and interact with, um, the heavier ones were created inside stars. Um, but those themselves came out of something that was pre-existing. So helium was caused by hydrogen just fusing. Hydrogen itself was fused um, in the early conditions of the universe when things were hot and dense enough uh, to fuse into atoms. And you've gone so far back now that, well, hey, presto, you're at the beginning of the universe. So the car didn't begin to exist, unless by that you mean the beginning of the universe, but then that's just encompassed by our list. So the universe really is the only thing that has truly begun to exist. Okay, anything that you can think of, you may have seen a child being born or a tree being planted, it's just a rearrangement of pre-existing matter. Even when you turn on a light or uh, turn on a heater, energy cannot be created or destroyed. And another one of Einstein's biggest findings was that energy and matter are the same thing. So nothing can be created, nothing can begin to exist except for the universe itself. As Carl Sagan put it, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. In fact, you can actually get his apple pie recipe, starting with one universe as your first ingredient. Uh, preparation time, 12 to 20 billion years, specifically 13.8. Of course, the point that he's trying to make is that the only thing that really began to exist is the universe. Everything else is just rearranging. Another contention which goes hand in hand is the idea of getting something from nothing. Now, when you listen to more experienced uh, theologians, people who have had a lot of time in the modern era to listen to the scientific arguments, uh, people such as this guy. Oh, crap, sorry, he got fired, didn't he? Um, <laughs> People like Bill O'Reilly, I don't understand why, just to digress for a minute, I mean, they put him on the same pedestal, they get him debating people like uh, Silverman and Dawkins as if um, they have the same sort of theological experience. It's absolutely fantastic. But one of the things that uh, it's good for is you get to see what everyday people who aren't interested in this stuff generally um, say to these kind of arguments. And the main thing that, that comes from it is, is, well, how can something come from nothing? Um, this is a contention that I hear all the time. If something can come from nothing, why doesn't it happen all the time? Okay, if things can just pop into existence, why doesn't a car just appear right here? Well, there's a simple reason for that. Um, the, the reason is that if you want something to pop into existence out of nothing, then you need some nothing to try it out on. Okay? So if, if a car jumped into existence right here, that wouldn't be out of nothing, because this is not nothing. This is oxygen, this is nitrogen, this is radiation. Okay, so if you want to try and get something popping into existence out of nothing, you need to find some nothing. Now, where are you going to find some nothing in the universe? Well, some of you might say, why not go into deep space? Look for a, a vacuum, a true vacuum. But the problem is, even that isn't technically nothing. Again, this is brand new science, but if you read works like A Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss, which is a fantastic book that I recommend to all of you, um, you find interesting nuggets of information, and I happen to stumble across this. If you removed all of the particles, all of the radiation, absolutely everything from space, and all that remained was nothing, that nothing would weigh something. What this means is that nothing isn't really nothing. So even if you were to find some nothing, it wouldn't really be nothing. Now, of course, most people, including uh, a lot of scientists, think that the, the weight is being caused by something. There is still something there that we just can't detect, like dark matter. But it's besides the point, because the point remains that we don't have any nothing. Okay, so how on earth can you possibly say either A, that things 
begin, that things that begin to exist have a cause if you've never seen anything begin to exist. How can you say that? And secondly, how can you say things like something from nothing, if that can happen, why, don't it, why doesn't it happen all the time? If it couldn't, maybe it does happen all the time, where there's nothing. But we don't have any nothing to test it out on. And this is what I think is the most glaring issue. People don't seem to understand what beginning to exist really means. But what are the implications? Well, if we go back to our um, premises, again, like I said, I'm focusing on premise one, and um, this is basically uh, to conclude, but I'm hoping to leave a lot of time for some discussion um, and conversation, because um, this isn't something that I've really heard many people talk about before. Perhaps I'm just missing it, but um, I'm hoping that at least some of you haven't thought about this specific argument before, so I'm really interested to hear if you have any contentions um, or anything to add. Because what it breaks down to is, in the context of the Kalam cosmological argument, remember, this isn't, this isn't a sort of end-all argument. I'm not here trying to prove to you that God does not exist. But the Kalam cosmological argument, and sort of by extension, um, its sister argument about just where did it all come from, which we've all come across at some point, perhaps we've even asked it ourselves, um, when somebody brings this argument up, you can simply prove to them how circular it is, in the sense that the premises, once you lay them out, this is what I recommend for you to do, lay out the premises for them and say, okay, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Well, we just said that everything that begins to exist, that's just the universe. The universe is the only thing that's begun to exist, right? So where we say whatever begins to exist, well, that's just the universe, because the universe is whatever begins to exist. It's the only thing that can, because if there was something else before it, that would be the universe. But the problem is we now, we now have a bit of an issue, because if we bring in the other premises, premise one, the universe has a cause, premise two, the universe began to exist, conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause. Of course, the second premise is pretty much redundant. Now, I don't know about you, but this suddenly doesn't seem so convincing. It's almost impressively circular. That's the thing about it. It's, it's, it's persuasive in the sense that you look at it, it looks deductive, it looks like it's sound, it looks like it makes sense, and it seems really simple. But when you break it down, it's circular, it's inductive at its philosophical basis, and it doesn't actually say anything. The universe has a cause, therefore the universe has a cause. And so this is my version of the Kalam cosmological argument. And that's all I have for my presentation. But I'm really interested uh, to hear what you have to say. So uh, thank you so much for listening. It's been absolutely wonderful. And I'm really interested to uh, have some discussion. A lot of hands up, I know. And bear in mind, I'm not an expert. I just run a YouTube channel. So, uh... <laughs> so I've listened to a lot of cosmolo cosmologists. Uh, there's a... Um, Foothill College has a, a science lecture series um, six times a year. And a couple of the, the cosmologists have argued, made the claim, I'm glad you said nothing is not really nothing. Yeah. That's one thing. Right. But the second thing they've said is that there's a theory that black holes popped, pop in and out of existence all over. In fact, even in this room, they can... Um, with, so in other words, that's one an example of something that may not have a cause. Black holes pop in and out of existence in a instant, mm. and yet they don't. Is it they is it no something that, that's well understood scientifically? I mean, because it sounds like I've heard things like this before. That um, when you break everything down, you, you you have sort of a quantum soup, and out of that, things are just popping all over the place, right? That's right. Yeah. But yeah. we don't fully understand it, and. If you ask me, firstly, the thing to say is that if, if we don't understand it, then it can't be used in argument. So um, if somebody tries to bring that up as a contention, you can say, again, well, you can't prove that, therefore um, it means nothing. But what I'd be interested to see is uh, the breakdown of that, because we don't know where that came from, but the likelihood is that, I mean, I would posit that it's probably got something to do um, with a breakdown of quantum physics. Um, I don't know anything about it, you see, but it seems that we, we don't know, so we can't say that there was no cause. But sure, surely we can, we can posit that, okay, so let's say that we did discover that these things were just popping into existence without a cause, right? Then we could then say, yes, things do begin to exist without a cause, and that would help us. 
However, if we found out that there was a cause for it, well, then we could just say, oh, well, okay, but this is existing within the universe, so all of this still applies. So either way, it seems like uh, the position is still completely tenable, and it wouldn't actually help a theist trying to present this argument either way. Because if, if you're right, or if the, if the implications of what you're saying are true, um, and things can pop into existence without a cause, well, that's our problem solved, isn't it? As I recall from reading A Universe from Nothing, and my quantum physics way back in college, is that we have what are called virtual particles that pop in and out of existence quite regularly. Right. And therefore you have events, that, or you have something coming into existence without a cause. Mm. And I think that's what Lawrence Krauss talks about yes. in the quantum indeterminacy. When you have nothing, you still have at least quantum fields, which can occasionally, with great rarity perhaps, according to him, cause a universe. Mm. But but they themselves are, are without cause. This is, yeah, this is the thing. Now, somebody might say to that, well, in essence, what, what you're saying there is that the universe that could pop into existence out of that was not necessarily caused, but came about through quantum processes that existed before. Um, but again, if that's the case, then the quantum processes that existed before would have been part of existence. So if, you're, if your definition of universe is everything that exists, then that would encompass it. So again, it's, it's an interesting point that I'd like to see um, really uh, uncovered by science, because again, it, it's, it's the same principle. Uh, right, but as, as, as Krauss noted, even if you took every, all the matter out of it and mm. energy, you still have quantum fields, which is what yeah. he calls nothing. So nothing, per se, doesn't exist. Yes, well, precisely, that's, that's it. Um, for nothing to exist, you, you need to be outside of the universe, because mm -hmm. if you're inside the universe, then, like you say, nothing isn't really nothing. Again, this is in uh, Lawrence Krauss's book. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're right, uh, in, in the sense that the, whatever does exist that we would call nothing isn't really nothing. So we can't say that things begin to exist because we, we couldn't possibly observe that. Because even if something did pop into existence out of what we perceive to be nothing, it's not really nothing. And so it wouldn't be the same as whatever caused the universe to come into existence because that would have come into existence out of truly nothing, and not nothing by our definition of nothing, um, that allows for these sort of uh, quantum fields, but out of truly nothing. Um, well, Krauss maintains truly nothing doesn't exist. Mm, well, that's, that quantum that's one of, I think that's one of Krauss's idiosyncrasies. Um, I'm not sure if many science, I, I, I don't know what the consensus is on that scientifically, but again, either way, um, it doesn't, uh, dis, it doesn't bolster support for the Kalam cosmological argument, but uh, it's certainly an interesting point of conversation. Um, I'd love to see it um, further uncovered because it would really it would have some interesting answers for, for science and it would have some really good implications as to how we can tackle the Kalam cosmological argument, but it would only ever help us. It would never help um, the theist, if you ask me. Mm. So um, I think your ideas are very rebellious, so I'd like to relabel your talk a, a rebel without a cause. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like it. Um, my question is, how, how do you address those people who say some things pop into existence, uh, for example, your soul or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, Look, some, some concepts rather than matter? As for matter. the soul, prove to me that the soul exists, then we can talk about where it came <laughs> from, right? Um, but you're right, things like symphonies, things like ideas, this is one thing that somebody put to me when I first presented this argument. They said, well, what about a thought? What about the idea that you've just had here? Surely that came out of nothing. But, again, it depends how we understand neurology. Because, of course, if everything that we are and everything we say and do and think um, is a result of brain processes and neurons in the brain, then ideas, all they are, are like emotional translations of neurological um, events. And so these things, again, if they can be fully explained, which they can through neurological processes, then again, we can trace that back right to the origin of the universe, because the atoms that are in your brain started in stars and have uh, ultimately started at the Big Bang and whatever came before it, possibly. Um, but yeah, so ideas, the soul, all this sort of stuff, even things that seem like they came from nothing, like light and energy, but yeah, they do all trace back um, at least one way or another to the beginning of the universe. Yeah, um, Krauss seems like he starts a universe from nothing by talking about the philosophical debate that would in, you know, inevitably pan out. And uh, he recently was on a panel of like five different um, 
philosophers talking about this, and he seemed to concede that at some point he he believes in the multiverse theory, and mm -hmm. that when he defines nothing, he's talking about no laws, no time, um, and they seem to jump on him saying that, oh, well, you're conceding that beneath, you know, this is some multiverse that could possibly give birth to the universe. And it seems like there's just this eternal debate about a philosophical idea of nothing mm. and a practical definition of yeah. nothing. And I'm wondering what, how you think the multi, him, him conceding that he could accept a multiverse as a possible solution, mm. and then at the same time essentially saying, not that he doesn't think that nothing in the way that Phil, philosophers want it to exist doesn't exist, but that he doesn't find that to be an interesting question, almost like the why question. Right, yeah, well, this is, this is something about, about Krauss that um, I, never, I never quite understood in the sense that he, he seems to make the point that, yeah, nothing, what we call nothing isn't really nothing, um, but that just surely means that we should change what we refer to um, as nothing. If, if the multiverse does exist, which I think most scientists nowadays seem to think it does, of course there's not really any evidence for it, um, it just seems like a logical um, conclusion at this point, but if that's the case then we completely remove the need for uh, causality because these things can be um, infinite. And then the discussion about nothing doesn't really come into it, because if we have an infinite universe we don't need to explain where it came from, we don't need to talk about things popping into existence out of nothing, because that may have never occurred. So with Krauss, if you're taking them both at the same time, the multiverse idea and the nothing discussion, um, it makes for an interesting philosophical debate about what nothing is, um, but all of a sudden it has absolutely nothing to do with God or a, uh, or a first mover because you've accepted the multiverse. Um, to me, it only really is interesting if you don't accept the multiverse, but also accept um, Krauss's idea that nothing isn't really nothing. Um, but the thing is, if nothing isn't really nothing, then why do we call it nothing? And if nothing is really nothing, then things popping into existence out of truly nothing, practical nothing, that would be what the universe came from, um, has no bearing on the philosophical debate about nothing. Right? I, I mean, I, it's, it's an interesting line of thought. Um, there is a distinction, it seems, uh, between practical and philosophical nothing, but it's just semantics. To me, they're the same thing. If you, if you say nothing, um, you probably don't mean nothing. But if you're talking about nothing in the context of um, the Kalam cosmological argument, then I'm going to stop you and say, well, that might be what you mean by nothing, but not by my definition. I got a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, are you familiar with Dan Barker's uh, response to the KCA? Uh, I'm not, no. Okay, and it has to do with him dividing all potential things into either NBE, which is not beginning to exist, or BE, which is beginning to exist. Okay. But what I really wanted to ask you was, uh, um, William Lane Craig jumps from your conclusion to a further conclusion, and that is that a personal God exists. And I was wondering if you can address the reasoning, uh, address and respond to the reasoning he uses to jump from your conclusion to a personal God exists. Well, what reasoning, right? <laughs> he, um, what William Lane Craig will do is he'll say, okay, um, the universe needs a cause. What, what, what he'll say, this is, this is something that actually caught me for a while and led me to this conclusion, in fact, was um, he would say that if there was a cause, he, he, he thought that the Kalam cosmological argument meant that there needed to be a cause. Um, but then he then further concluded, like you say, um, that this cause would, of course, need to be immaterial. It would need to be timeless but also personal. And the reason he thought it needed to be personal is because he thought it needed to make a choice. Because if the cause that exists is infinite, which it must be, uh, but the effect is finite, that is the universe, you can't have an infinite cause and a finite effect unless there's some kind of decision by that infinite cause at some point in time to uh, create the universe. And I, I thought about this for a very long time, but then it suddenly I suddenly realized, well, if we're talking about everything, including time again, um, then it doesn't make any sense again. There, there's no choice to be made. It's not like an infinite being can make a choice at a point in time if time doesn't exist. Um, so you can have an infinite being. Um, we, we can't picture infinity that exists within this universe, let alone picturing infinity without time. That's such a nonsense concept, but if it does exist, uh, there's no reason to think that we can't have um, an infinite cause and a finite effect if you're taking out time 
Um, it's something that we couldn't hope to understand, and so it's not... Um, I never understood how William Lane Craig seems to use it as if he understands, he's got this higher level of understanding of infinity and, and knows exactly what the implications would be without time, but he doesn't even uh, seem to concede of the idea that time would not exist for this timeless being. I mean, how can you say, firstly, that this being must be timeless, but secondly, that it must make a decision at a point in time, therefore, it's a personal God? If you ask me, like a lot of what he says, it doesn't seem to make much sense at the very best of, uh, best of um, explanations. But um, yeah, t it, doesn't even, it doesn't even worry me in the slightest when somebody brings that up because it seems like all they've done is fail to really consider the implications of um, a timeless being um, and the effect on that being personal. But it's a complete leap of faith to say that if there's a cause, it must be personal. I mean, why does this cause need to care about us? Why does this cause need to care about Earth in particular? And um, now that we understand so much about the vastness of the universe, um, his position is pretty much untenable. He's, he's looking at these romantic views of the ancient philosophers. Um, he's actually very largely influenced by people like Al-Ghazali and Al-Kindi and uh, traditional Islamic theology. Um, but back then, nobody had the faintest idea about the vastness of the universe. So to try and take that same logic and apply it today, it's completely foolish. So I've got uh, like four or more questions queued up. So I'll, I'll get to you guys as, as I've seen you raise your hands, okay? Um, I'm thinking of the way that a theist would say, they, well, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, mm. that would be the beginning of the universe, right? Mm. Which means that God must have been there before the universe, which means God is supernatural. Mm. And then... I guess if you're trying to discuss things with them without um, deciding that they have rewritten the language, mm. it makes it hard to even have a discussion oh, yeah. that, you know... That yeah, well, I mean, look, the, the Star Wars says a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I mean, it, mean, it means nothing. Um, and you're right, you, you often can't get very far with these people um, if they're completely stuck um, with their biblical beliefs, but this is almost like what I was saying at the beginning of the talk. My, my main reason for doing what I do, I, I don't particularly care if you believe in God or not. I mean, philosophically speaking, it's very interesting, and if you're open to have a discussion, I'm always willing. But really, the reason I'm here is because I am fed up of religion influencing the politics which influences me. I'm fed up of people using their religion and shoving it down the throat of children. You know, in my home country, one in three public funded schools are faith schools. One in three. Now, that's illegal here, but, um, you know, the law is often break, uh, broken. Your National Prayer Day, for example, um, you know, you wait. It's around the corner. You'll have, much like the UK, um, it creeps into public affairs, and I, I don't want this to happen. That's the reason I do this stuff. But you're not going to get anywhere with it. You can talk all you like. You'll say, well, look, religion is influencing politics and education. And they'll say, good. So the only way you're going to change anything, uh, change their mind on this issue is not by saying that God is evil. Um, you're going to do it by talking about this sort of stuff, by saying, well, okay, that first uh, line of the Bible, in the beginning, does that even really make any sense? And once you can get them on that, then you can start opening a world of possibilities for the moral implications. Okay, so one counter argument that I've definitely heard several times, which one flaw I've found is that it does assume that there's a God, but wait, hold on, I took a note, because I forget things. Okay, uh, <laughs> so it's that we don't see things come from nothing because God made the universe and he is the only one that can make something out of nothing. And they also, I've heard like people argue that, oh, well, there never was truly nothing. And what was there before nothing? Well, there wasn't nothing because God was there. Mm. And I was just like, of course, there's a flaw that it, it does assume that there is a God. Um, which is a flaw in itself, but I was just wondering how you would respond to something like well, that. Well, yeah, that's the first thing I'd, I'd probably say is that it, it assumes a God, but when you're talking with a theist, oftentimes most of their um, rebuttals do assume a God. Um, but if the theist is going to ask why is there something rather than nothing, then you might just fire back, well, why is there God rather than nothing? And this is this pretty much the same thing as saying, well, what caused God? It's sort of throwing it back in their face. And it's almost like... Um, 
it's almost petty, this kind of stuff. But if they're bringing up petty arguments, you've got to give them petty responses. Um, the first, what was the first thing you said, the first part of the rebuttal? I go. Oh, right, yeah. Well, again, but th this is the thing. If, if the theist is going to say that we don't see things come from nothing, um, the only thing that really did come from nothing is the universe because God did it, well, then this argument doesn't make any sense. Because how can you say that everything that begins to exist has a cause if the only thing that really did begin to exist was the universe? Um, if your conclusion is that the universe has a cause, then starting by saying that the universe has a cause and that cause is God isn't getting you anywhere. So then what you have is you have a theist who's stating a case. They're simply saying the universe has a cause. Because they're saying that which began to exist has a cause. What they're really saying is that the universe has a cause. So they're just making a statement. So then if you point that out to them first, then you can say, look, I don't know if you realize this, but that's what you're doing. You're just stating an opinion. So now can you come up with an argument to back it up? And that's when you'll hear the kind of contentions which I try to um, discuss in the presentation. But to that, the best thing that you can probably do is point out that they're being circular. They're either being circular or they're just not saying anything, but it sounds like they're saying something. It's like the ontological argument um, sounds logically sound. It sounds like you're saying something, but it just doesn't feel right, and you know that it's that it's not. And when you break it down, it, it's not actually saying anything. It's just saying, I think God exists, because I think God exists. Um, that's, that's what I think that the person who was saying that would be doing. But you have to point out to them exactly um, how it is that they've got from that position to where they are now. Otherwise, they'll just say, no, 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 it's an argument. You need to prove to them that it's not an argument, and then give them the chance to logically defend it, um, which oftentimes they can't. It seems to me that, um, um, that it seems to me that uh, you you can. I, I don't really personally care about the God argument. I, I don't care if God exists or not. But there's still need. Uh, there's still a need to explain how the universe comes to be in the sense that if you imagine the universe as a series of dominoes, and one domino not over another domino as a series of cause and effects, right? Mm. Then you have a series of dominoes with cause and effects. But then you can look at the whole universe as a series of dominoes. Yes. But then you can ask why this series of dominoes causing one one domino by another domino, you know, exactly, and yeah. not another series of dominoes. Well, so that's the that's the reformulation of the ancient question: Why is there something is of nothing, right? Because you can say why is this whole series exists mm. instead of some other series. Well, that, that's, where, that's where we start, is this idea yeah. that it doesn't seem to make sense why any of this even got going without a God. And this domino effect, um, effectively, is a good way of, of talking about this idea that things that seem to begin to exist, like a baby being born or a car being made, really it's just uh, the end of a, a domino uh, effect that traces its roots all the way back to the universe. But what you then are left to explain is the finger that pushed the domino. But the thing is, who's to say that there needed to be a finger uh, to push the domino. That, that's the thing. And another thing is, it doesn't actually, this isn't, the reason I don't talk about this in the Kalam cosmological argument is it because it has no relevance. But if you're talking about it just in the sense that there needs to be a cause, um, there's absolutely no reason to suggest that this cause would need to be um, a god. And then also you're left with this idea that, well, we don't actually know that the universe began to exist at all. So if you're talking about the Kalam cosmological argument, I like to focus on the first premise. But if you're just talking about the domino effect and cause and effect, then really you can just say, well, how do you know that there was a first finger? How do you know that there was a beginning? How do you know that um, this domino effect doesn't just go back into eternity? It, it's just something that we, we can't really talk about until we have um, better answers for. And I don't think we're ever really going to get them. So we're left in this agnostic uh, phase. We're, le we're, we're left sort of not knowing how to uh, talk about this second premise. So we have to kind of focus on the first. Um, but if you think there needs to be an explanation for how um, the universe came into being, then so be it, um, and I wish you all the best and luck in finding one, but if, if somebody comes to you claiming that they know um, that the cause is God, and they know that that God is male, and that he had a son, and that if you don't abide in him, you're going to hell, well, I'd tell that, well, you know what I'd tell that person to do. Hi. Um, my question is, where do you see yourself uh, in five or six years from now? Because I know that uh, you started from uh, scratch in YouTube making videos, but what I, I noticed is that some of the atheist pages on YouTube or social media, uh, because the taste 
the taste uh, arguments are never going to change. I mean, you, you, you still have the same four or five arguments all the time. You've got the creationists, you've got the uh, cosmological argument, you've got the uh, fine-tuning argument. They're never, they're never going uh, to change, whereas science is always uh, moving forward. So uh, what it seems to me that whereas the taste, the tastes are always going to be the same, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes atheists get stuck in YouTube. For example, uh, you have the amazing, the amazing atheist example, which is it's now rebranded to TJ. It's not even the amazing atheist anymore. If you find it on YouTube, uh, so he jumps from. Uh, he jumps from uh, arguing with uh, taste to social justice warriors or political comments, yes. some, some sort of uh, yes. so that type of content. So mm. what I'm asking you is, do you see yourself getting bored of uh, debunking taste? Mm. Right. Well, and the second question is, mm -hmm. where do you uh, where where's your stand on? Social issues on political okay, issues. Okay, right. Well, uh, oh, this is great. I didn't think I'd get the opportunity to talk about myself. Um, to answer your question, yeah, I, I don't think the arguments are going anywhere, and they are the same arguments, like you say. The arguments that we have now, the things I'm discussing in this presentation, they have been discussed for thousands of years, maybe longer. The thing that we can do is we can reshape the way that we present them. Okay, so there's um, a generation of people who have never heard these arguments before, and they'll hear them from the very people you're talking about. And unless there are uh, people out there who are still debunking this kind of stuff, um, people will be persuaded by it. I mean, when was the last time that you met the average person who had you know, just finished reading the works of Plato? You know, these people, sure, they're still around and you can still study them, but they're not in the, the public consciousness as much as they used to be. So um, for me, as long as it's not, it's not a case of whether I want to continue talking about this stuff, it's do, do the opposition want to continue talking about this stuff. Um, opposition is probably a bad word, but you see what I'm saying. Um, and as long as they're talking about it, you know, I'll be around to tell them why they're wrong or why I think they're wrong. Um, it almost seems counterintuitive because, of course, if I succeeded in my mission um, of convincing everybody of my position, then I'd be out of a job. Um, but I suppose that just goes to show how much I think it's worth it. Um, you, you do see, um, particularly on YouTube, people um, switching because they do run out of things to talk about. Um, but the reason that I, I think that happens is because a lot of the time with YouTube, what someone will do is they'll start up a YouTube channel, they'll, they'll see a video that they don't like, um, and that they'll, they'll set up a YouTube channel and they'll respond to it, and all of a sudden they get a bunch of views and they think, oh great, okay, I, I should do this. They, they dive into it and they say all they have to say, they talk about the cosmological and teleological arguments, they talk about Pascal's wager, all of these sort of uh, the fine tuning and then they've sort of run out and they don't know where to go. And the reason this happens is because these people aren't philosophers, right? They're just people who, uh, who started a YouTube channel. And in fact, they might start their YouTube channel and think, oh, this is going so well, I don't need to go to university. I don't need to, um, I can drop out of education because I can just do this for the rest of my life. Um, and I think that's almost why they run out of ideas because they think that they, they have safety in the sense that they have a large audience. It doesn't matter what I talk about, these people are, these people are, gonna, are, are gonna listen to me. So when they run out of ideas on atheism, they start talking about social issues. No problem, fine. It's not what I want to do. So for me, I'm not going to say, yeah, I have a, a YouTube channel that's going pretty well. That's great. I'm set. I'm just going to keep talking like that. No, no. I'm just, I'm still a person who's in education. I'm going to go to university. I'm going to study this stuff. And I do a YouTube channel on the side. So hopefully I won't run out of things to talk about. But if I do run out of things to talk about, then I'll stop talking. That's it. That's the thing. People want to carry on talking and they're rehashing the same stuff over and over again. And they're doing it because they, they need to make money or they, they need to keep their uh, popularity up. No. Once I'm done, I'm done. So I, I'm not going to go on to talk about um, social issues in the future. Um, for me, it, it, it's like it's almost too much to get into here my, because social issues are such a broad spectrum. Um, what, the one thing I will say on that is that it's almost an assumption if you meet someone who's an atheist that everyone thinks they're a massive liberal, definitely going to be pro-choice, definitely going to be anti-gun, definitely going to vote Democrat. Um, but this is this is a bit of a well, this isn't the case. You know, you shouldn't assume people's social um, positions just because of their religious beliefs. Um, it seems a bit counterintuitive to do so. Um, but perhaps I can speak to you after um, after this, and I can happily fill you in on my uh, social positions on things. Um, but it's not something I'm going to probably be talking about on the YouTube channel. Great, so we're gonna do like one or two more questions and then uh, 
Are you hanging around afterwards? Oh, absolutely, yeah. All right, sure. so you can definitely talk to him one-on-one -on -one after if I miss you. Yeah, so uh, one comment I would wanted to make is that you're twisting the definition of the word to exist mm -hmm. because everybody understands that a person begins to exist when it is bo born or at least is conceived. Mm -hmm. So, but then what does it mean to exist? Sure. It is to become a configuration of matter that deserves a new name. Mm -hmm. And then all that cosmological argument is the universe is, exists because we think it deserves a name. Yeah, I, and I, the cause is us wanting to to name it. That's all. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Um, in the sense that um, a car or a child does begin to exist because it is a new concept. It's a new thing that we that we apply. It's a, um, you know, why would we give it a new name if it wasn't something new that began to exist? And sure, what I'm doing when I'm talking about beginning to exist. Um, what I mean by that is something genuinely beginning to exist out of nothing. Now that might not be what existence really means, but in the context of this argument, that's how it's being used. So the person bringing up this argument is saying, if everything has a cause, um, sorry, if everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe must have a cause. Um, they're saying the, um the universe must have a cause because it begins to exist out of nothing. And so the first premise that they're using to back that up must use the same definition of beginning to exist. Now, in other situations, you might change what you mean by beginning to exist. Sorry? Yes, you mean as in they're committing... Yes. Mm. Well, what, what you need to do is you need to work on the definition of the person you're arguing against. Because again... As atheists, it's very rare, unless you're like an anti-theist making an active claim, it's very rare that you're the one putting a position forward. So what you need to do is if somebody puts an argument like this argument and they say everything begins to exist, then you say, well, hang on, what do you mean by that? Because either you mean um, that it begins to exist out of nothing, in which case, well, that, yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense because you've never seen that happening, or you don't. And then you, why would you, then you're committing the fallacy of composition, then you're committing the equivocation fallacy. You can't then apply that to the universe. So um, you need to work with their definition, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, but even if they say that their definition is different, um, you're still going to be off to a running start, I think. Okay, last question. I'm curious to know if uh, you were raised atheist. What, was, was there religion in your household? Right. Um, well, the first thing, I don't think anybody's raised atheist. I think people are just raised irreligiously. People are raised correctly, you might say. Um, I, I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Um, I'm quite grateful for it, actually. I think if I hadn't have gone to Catholic school and, and given the opportunity to be exposed to Catholicism at its heights, or shall we say its lows, um, I may still be a Roman Catholic. Because you can often tell when somebody... Um, if somebody's a Roman Catholic or, or any other denomination of Christianity or any other religion, one of the reasons that might be is because they haven't fully analyzed um, their religion. They've just been brought up in it, they've been told it's what's true, um, and they've, they've run with it. So the fact that I was able to be taught this stuff in detail because I was brought up religious almost made me an atheist, um, which, is, which is quite bizarre. But so yeah, I, I don't resent the fact that I was brought up religious, but one of the reasons for that is because although I was brought up religious, it wasn't steadfast by any means. It was really, really relaxed. Um, we went to church most of the time. You know, um, I asked a lot of questions in RE, um, religious education, I suppose you call it RS here. Um, but it was just, it was just a case of, of, of asking questions. I, I became an atheist not because of some sort of event that took place and I suddenly realized that God didn't exist. It was just over time, I, I think it was probably around the time I actually started disbelieving in Santa Claus as it happens. Um, I, just, I just stopped believing in it. But I was raised, um, was raised Catholic. The one thing that I do have to say for it, I've made a video on this. Um, this is the reason people often say, well, okay, you were raised a Catholic, so what does it matter? You know, you became an atheist, you can still think for yourself. Who cares, right? Well, no. Because sometimes... I will be sat on a bus, I'll be looking out of a window in traffic, I'll be minding my own business, and all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, whoa, I'm, I'm an apostate, I'm going to hell, I'm going to suffer, and then I'm out of it. And for a minute, for some reason, it just comes back. All the stories that you thought of as a child, yeah, your teachers only told you that you need saving, they didn't teach you the bad stuff. 
but the kid's going to ask, if I need saving, what do I need saving from? So you get on Google and you see the pictures of hell and you see the pictures of Satan and that stays with you. It really does. Um, it, it, sta it just does. And so, yeah, I may be an atheist, but the psychological effects that it had on me, um, I still resent. And like I say, I didn't grow up in a steadfast religious community. I grew up where it was pretty um, calm and relaxed. So for someone who's brought up where it was instilled in them and there was no other answer, I can't imagine the psychological effects that must have on a person. So, yeah, I was brought up religious, and I don't resent it in the sense that um, I still turned out an atheist, but I do resent it in the, in the sense that um, it left me with psychological effects. Um, not nearly as bad as some people have it. You know, I'm not trying to have some kind of soft story here, but... Um, it's one of the reasons that, that I do what I do, because I wasn't just born in, well, I was born an atheist, everyone's born an atheist, but um, I wasn't just sort of always been an atheist and I just started getting interested and thought that it would be interesting to talk about this stuff philosophically. I know what it's, what it's like to be told something and really believe it to be true and what it takes um, to be convinced otherwise, and that's why um, I do what I do. So I think one of the reasons that I do this is because I was um, brought up religious, but um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it, um, answer any specific questions you have about my upbringing, but it was just a pretty typical um, Catholic upbringing, as is a lot of the UK, because the UK is officially a, a Christian country. It's odd, the, the UK is very secular, but officially Christian. America is constitutionally secular, but very religious. It's, it's weird, but it's just the way things go. Um, but because of my upbringing, because I know what it can do to people and what it's done to my friends and my friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, and I don't know if many people know, but I, I had no idea just how bad it was. But you speak to some of those people and then, you know, you look me in the eye and tell me that we don't need to do something about this. I mean, seriously, it's, it's, if you don't know much about um, the, the bad effects of religion, psychologically speaking, look into ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Listen to some of their stories. And you'll see why I decided to start doing what I'm um, doing and, and making my sort of small smash, uh, splash into the, into the community. All right, let's give Alex another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.